Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today at uh, BookNet Canada Tech Forums. Let's judge a book by its cover panel. Uh, my name is Stephen Beatty. I am a critic and book reviewer in Stratford, Ontario, and it is my pleasure to be here. I haven't done one of these in quite some time. The uh, Canadian Book Professionals Association used to hold an annual uh, cover panel, and a number of our panelists today uh, will be uh, who will be participating today were part of that panel back decades ago. Um, and in that situation, uh, we gathered in a bar and had lots of drinks and it often became a little ruckus. Um, we are not together today, unfortunately. We're doing this over Zoom, so it may be a little less ruckus. Um, there will certainly be less alcohol consumed, uh, but uh, we hope to uh, provide you with an enjoyable hour and a half talking about cover design, what makes for a good cover, what makes for a misfire, what designers look for when they're designing, so on and so forth. Um, there is a chat function um, uh, on the side of the uh, computer. You may not be able to see it, but one of the things that I have been um, told is that if you would like to link to closed captioning for this session, we do have uh, closed captioning uh, along with our AL, uh, ASL interpreter. Um, you can find the live transcript button at, in the Zoom menu at the bottom of your screen. Click on that choose show subtitle and that will give you live closed captioning for the event. I think the first thing we should do is we should introduce our panel of esteemed designers and commentators. As I say, my name is Stephen Beatty, um, a reviewer from Stratford. I'll be acting as moderator. On the panel today, we have Ingrid Paulson, who is the uh, owner of Ingrid Paulson Design and Typography. We have Jasmine Welsh, who is the production manager at Arsenal Pulp Press and the uh, administrator of Fleck Creative Studio, the CEO of Fleck Creative Studio. Natalie Olson runs Kiss, Kiss Cut Design, and she is also one half of Hingston and Olson Publishing, which you may know from the annual short story advent calendar. Gigi Lau is a part of Tundra Book Group, Penguin Random House. And finally, from Rakuten Kobo, we have Nathan Maharaj. Welcome to all of you, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> oh, here, can everybody hear? Can everybody, I think I can see everybody. Can everybody hear? And everybody's got their mics working? Excellent. Then we might as well just uh, get right into the questions for today's, uh, for today's panel. A lot of these questions are going to be very general because back in the day, um, those of you who, who participated in this panel back in the day, um, you'll remember that we had a screen on which we projected our favorite and least favorite covers and were able to talk about them. Working on Zoom is a little bit more difficult, not least because we've got a bunch of tiny screen windows and it's very difficult to, to add um, visuals to that and have it remain coherent. So a lot of these questions are going to be very general, um, design questions, best practices, that kind of thing. Uh, I have been told that Lauren is going to be observing this and in the chat, she may pop up some, uh, some visuals. Uh, if that does happen, I will certainly draw everybody's attention to that. In the meantime, uh, I think the first, the best way to start is with a general question for the entire panel. And uh, that involves general design principles that you all may operate under. Um, and I'm interested in finding out what a book designer should look for and or try to avoid when designing a cover. I understand that this is going to vary from cover to cover, but if there are any general principles that you operate under, um, it will be interesting to hear about those just as a way to kick off the discussion. And maybe Ingrid, we can start with you. Um, well, the biggest thing is to never give away the story, like the entire story. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> Never show who the killer is in a thriller. Um, never, never show who the criminal is in a, in a crime thriller. That you know, whatever. Um, you try to uh, hint. the The best thing a book designer does is try to ask questions visually, to um, lure somebody toward the book. And um, 
just sort of give them a sense of what what the insight is because we're not the ones actually writing the story or researching the nonfiction memoir or whatever. We are the ones who are packaging it. We're just trying to get a face onto it. So, and and is that do you just sort of go by by general feel with that? Like, how do you know where the line is drawn between giving away too much and giving a potential reader uh, an idea of what they're in for? Anyone else? <laughs> um, well, I mean, you can start with the basic premise that if if the cover, if the title says um, the book has a, the book is about apples, you don't show an apple on the cover. So because already you've stopped asking questions, you stopped putting placing the title with an in, image or um, a mood or a, a scene. Um, and what you're trying to get is so people can ask, figure out an answer between the image and the title itself and what the two are describing. So it's a contrast. Um, when you start to describe the title almost too exactly, and you can get away with that, but generally um, you're gonna turn people off because they have assumptions then about what the book is about. The book is about trees. If it says a tree grows in the forest and there's a tree in a forest. <laughs> but you know, but um, sometimes you can do that if it's style, um, alludes to mood, um, era, uh, setting, that kind of thing. Gigi, do you, do you agree with Ingrid about those principles and how would you modify those for children's publishing as somebody who works with Tundra? Sorry, Gigi, we can't hear you. Do, I, do you have your mic muted? No, we're still not getting you. I think I, I, if I may put a pin in that um, while while we uh, we try to sort. Oh, there you go. There you go. Okay, good. Sorry about that. All right, perfect. <laughs> there you go. Um, I just wanted to preface this by saying it's my day four for me at this new uh, role at Tundra. So um, I think I'll be speaking more about my experience the last 16 years with Harlequin and at HarperCollins doing the Fair adult. Enough. Fair and enough. also YA books. Um, <laughs> I'm excited to be here to talk to everyone. Um, but I do agree with what Ingrid's saying. Uh, also agree with you know not revealing too much or showing too much on the cover. Uh, it's just too too much. Like it's putting a lot of of um, pressure on the cover, which is this 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 you know scale down size, especially when it's digital versus in, in person, it's still a very short time frame where you just wanna grab someone's attention. Um, so I think grabbing it, uh, your attention and creating a compelling piece of design, whether it's type included with image or illustration, um, that's really integral to, to cover design. Are, are there specific ways that you would go about attracting a reader's attention because one of my design mentors in the industry said to me at one point years ago that if you can get a prospective buyer to pick up a book in a bookstore half of your job is done and and like what what are there any things that you would gravitate towards specifically that would attract someone's eye on say a book table or if a book is faced out on a shelf or does that change from book to book yeah, I think it's really specific to each book right. um, or genre, right. per se. For example, thrillers, I think a lot of covers, you know, have a lot of dark covers, but you want to use some kind of compelling contrasting color in the type or the image to grab your attention amongst the whole shelf or table of thrillers and suspense. Right. right. Um, and being, I think, um, on top of what's current or trendy, but you also want to stand out amongst if everyone's using green which no one not a lot of people do but if they do <laughs> there's a reason yeah, yeah. No. and it's not the reason you think it is <laughs> there, there was a, a period not too long ago where I noticed a, a slew of red covers so you would go into a bookstore and you would see just these shelves full of red and it was very difficult to differentiate one book from the other so I, I take what you're saying and we can talk a little bit more about trends and so on a little bit later, but Natalie, I thought uh, we'd come to you next. Do you have any general design principles? Is there any um, sort of philosophy that you work with as you're designing overall? 
I mean, I'd say I adhere to the Peter Mendelssohn school of thought, uh, where the cover should evoke the feeling of what it's like to be immersed in the story. Um, so again, that's very consistent with what Ingrid was talking about. Um, you don't want to give away too much. Uh, and really, the only way to get there is through a really close reading of the material and trying to find that little nugget or whatever, whatever it is, whether it's one sentence, one detail, or just an overarching theme uh, to somehow put on the cover to draw people in. Uh, I'm really attracted to the unexpected on covers. So, you know, if the title is an apple and there's a picture of an orange paired with that, then that to me is interesting right off the bat. I love that example. Um, I think it was Chip Kidd um, that talked about that. Uh, but anyways, I also, I've noticed lately in uh, bookstores when you walk in a lot of the times they have uh, these featured tables where the the books aren't at eye level necessarily so they're not face out on shelves they're all together on a table so you've got like a sea of books right. you're looking down at and I feel like because you don't have to figure out where to look eye level wise on a shelf um, you really get to figure out what's catching your attention what isn't because they're all on e on an equal playing field um, so right. I really like that, that trend. I don't know if anyone else has noticed that when you go into stores, it's, it's a lot of flat tables around. Um, and then you can really ask yourself, what am I drawn to here? Because there's nothing that's being presented right for me. I have to seek it out basically down there. Um, I think that's really neat. It, it's, it's always easier from my perspective as a book buyer. Um, and, and you can, you can probably, um, you know, you can tell me whether, you know, this is, this influences the way you design books. It's always easier if something is faced out on a table or faced out on a shelf to jump out at you. And I don't know whether, you know, um, you know, if you work for, and you do work for um, smaller publishers, which generally get, you know, orders in ones and twos that are spined out on the shelf. Do you do anything with the spines to make them jump out? Is there anything that, uh, you know, that, that you have to think about in that regard? The spine has become very important. Yeah. I mean, anytime you can throw some spa gloss on there or foil or a little icon or have something wrapping around. I love it when things from the front and back cover wrap around so that right. you, you have to pull it out and look to see what's there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the spine's almost equally important as the as the front these days, uh, or at least it's a fun, fun thing to work with anyways, from a design point of view small real estate <laughs> <laughs> unless you're talking about like a 900 page biography of Vladimir Putin, <laughs> which I have on my shelf right now uh Jasmine what about you what what are your uh what are your sort of general design principles yeah I think um I agree with what has been touched on already like that idea of showing and telling like if you're going to tell something on the cover you don't necessarily want to show it directly um and I think that sense of creating a subtle sense of mystery, something that's maybe left out so that, as Ingrid said, you're just kind of hinting at the content of the story and you're not giving it all away because you want someone to pick it up to try to figure out that story for themselves, to be um, inquisitive as to what they will be reading. Um, so you're trying to hint at the right genre and make sure that they're, um, you know, going to be choosing the book that matches what they're looking for. Um, and there's no they're not going to be disappointed when they actually read the book. But so there's like that balance, as you said, between, you know, hinting and not giving away too much versus, you know, telling the right story on the cover as well. Right, right. Uh, Nathan, you're coming at this from a little bit different angle um, as a, a bookseller. Um, but I know from past experience on these panels that you have very, very um, passionate ideas about what works and what doesn't. So what for you as, as somebody who's looking at covers with this express purpose of deciding is this going to sell? What do you look for? Yeah, you know, it's, it's well, first of all, I'd say I think my opinions are somewhat less impassioned uh, at 1.30 in the afternoon, not in a bar and without a drink, just <laughs> <laughs> some, I'm somewhat attenuated. Um, but I, I, I don't see it so much as what will sell because, because honestly, I, I mean, this is the only adult job I've had and I still don't know what will sell. But but certainly it's it the the everything everything uh, that that's that's been said is fascinating. I love hearing all of you talk. Um, uh, Jasmine made a point about genre that I think is really important um, because you readers don't want the bait and switch, and you can do a lot to prepare the reader for what the book offers 
um, by cueing into um, genre conventions. Um, at the same time, it can go it can go other ways. You can take a thriller, maybe with something like literary ambitions, and give it more of a literary treatment, and find it under consideration for different prizes, find it in circulation among readers who don't think they love thrillers, uh, but this was great. So, so it's really interesting how the packaging can situate things. We actually had a discussion about this at Kobo um, because we have our, our annual prize, the Emerging Writer Prize, and there's always one, uh, one component is genre fiction, and it's a different genre every year on a three-year cycle. And we frequently have that conversation about like this book, is it, you know, it was submitted in the, in the genre or it was submitted in literary fiction. And it's always a question of like, is it here or there? And, and um, I think frequently though we don't talk about it, I'm thinking about it now in real time as, as we have this conversation. I think a lot of what informs that confusion sometimes um, is the cover. Is it, is it, we went in with, with a set of expectations because of, of certain um, uh, genre conventions. I'm interested because I did want to segue into talking about genre. So, so thank you for, for making my job very, very seamless. We're, we're in sync as ever, buddy. <laughs> uh, I'm interested in how you go about conveying the idea that this is a book from a particular genre without falling into cliche. And Jasmine, you brought it up. So, so maybe we could start with you. Um, how do you avoid cliches when dealing with, like for example, with a thriller, you don't necessarily put, or a mystery, you don't necessarily put a bloody knife on the cover because that seems to be too obvious. Well, you know, what would you do instead? Yeah, I think um, as Natalie mentioned, like the start of any good cover is that close reading. So if you're going to avoid tropes and you know not repeating things that have already been done, it's essential to kind of pull out maybe a smaller piece of the story from the setting, a metaphor that's brought up, something that the character does, like a small minute detail that would be interesting to draw the attention. Um, so you can still play with the idea of genre in terms of the look and feel, because again, you don't want to mislead the reader. So you still want to signal that there's horror there, but that's part of also looking at comp titles and seeing what's out on the market so that you're not um, doing what everybody else is doing, but you're also, you know, not ignoring it altogether either right. so you don't want to copy the knife that's on the cover or the you know the back of the woman or someone you know walking through a dark alleyway or whatever it is but you want to know what's out there do your own thing and, and kind of copy the mood and I think that was signaled from all the other panelists as well I think it genre really comes down to the feeling that you would of course get through the close read and the voice of the author as well so that kind of becomes the the most important part I think We've talked about thrillers, but what about romance or historical romance, Gigi? If you, um, you know, presumably Harlequin has some uh, some pretty sad ideas about how cover design should be and what they should convey. Um, how do you work within those constraints for for that genre? Yeah, it's definitely um, interesting since the audience is expecting to see certain tropes or certain like clinches or um, the right mood. So. I think in those instances, we just really try to make sure the cover is reflective of what the author has uh, envisioned in terms of the characters um, and and making sure we're meeting um, the, the reader's expectations. I think in that genre, um, depending on within romance, there's, there's many subgenres, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, I think, you know, most of the time we're just trying to make sure your, um, like I said, meeting the reader's expectations and and then freshen up some of the looks is, is either the setting or maybe the type design, um, changing that up to peak um, new readers. Natalie, what about uh, more literary um, fiction? I know you've done a lot of work with um, places like free handbooks uh, and, and um, you know, is there is there a different approach to doing work that is considered quote unquote literary fiction as opposed to genre mystery or um, romance or sci-fi. Um, and I, I have to preface this by saying I hate that term literary fiction, but we use it just for, you know, categorizing types of books. Sure. I appreciate that. I haven't done very many um, it's like romance, sci-fi, uh, YA, that type of thing. I, I definitely do mostly literary fiction. So I'm not sure I, I, 
I've ever thought about it that what that way. I think um, depending on the size of the press, there's always that struggle between making it seem like a big, you know, big, big book type uh, cover that fits in with the the big houses, and then also just doing its own thing and having having your own voice and not worrying about competing with some of those titles um, from an aesthetic point of view. Um, but I'd say there's more freedom to just stay true to the content and not worry so much about that general appeal. Uh, the smaller uh, literary presses also tend to, I think, factor in the opinions of their authors, and um, it's very valuable to have to have happy authors um, at that at that level. So, I think there's uh, more emphasis on staying true to the work and less on on that sort of typical appeal of the, you know, big, tight, flashy, this uh, fitting in with the, the top 10, whatever. As, as someone who freelances, um, do you find that you are able to submit um, comps that, that interest you? Or do you find that that sort of impulse is restricted by what the press wants or demands? Oh, I mean, I never, I mean, I never compromise. I, I always send, I always send what I feel strong, you know, I, after the careful reading of the book and the considered reading, I send what I feel is, is the best fit. Um, and, and I'll definitely push, push for things. Um, I mean, that's the beauty of sending more than one comp though, because then I can send the idea I'm really passionate about that I know is pushing some, some limits, but I, I think should be considered. Um, but then also send some other ideas that are a little bit safer or taking different directions. Uh, so then you've got all, all different approaches to consider. Um, but yeah, I think there's definitely a lot of freedom in the literary fiction genre. I, I, I would say it's my favorite for that reason. You can take some risks and uh, have some fun with the, you know, the, the boundaries of genre. Speaking of taking risks and having some fun, one of my all-time favorite uh, literary fiction covers is uh, an Ingrid Paulson cover for Tamara Faithberger's Maidenhead, ah. <laughs> which is, if anybody has read it, it is a very, very explicit, sexually graphic novel. But Ingrid, you used uh, paper. Cut paper on the front. Yeah. Um, what, maybe you could talk a little bit, this is the first time we've, we've talked about a specific book, but maybe you could talk a little bit about how you came to that, um, design and, and what it, what it reflected for you. Um, well, I, again, it's a very highly sexualized book and, um, I've been in the business long enough that I knew that, um, for it to get into, uh, Indigo for example, or many other, many other places. There was like, like, would this work in Moose Jaw was always a question that was asked, you know, would, would the smaller independents actually stock this? And so you have to toe a line about what sexualization, co sexual content on a cover can be, especially with literary. Um, so <laughs> I was just trying to find some way to explain um, virginity and lack thereof and female um, genital genitalia and uh, the word slit <laughs> came to mind. And then I was like, well, I can't just, you know. Um, so I started thinking about what's the most least sexual thing I can put on the cover, it's paper. <laughs> it's paper. So I just, <laughs> I found an image which actually was a stock image of somebody trying to make a nice Christmas tree out of a slit in paper so it folds into triangles and it ends up being the sort of reveal conceal thing um, that was also a part of the uh, storyline itself of hiding under clothing and, and reaching under and that kind of thing so and we went on from there to use paper on most of our other books in some sort of sexualized way. <laughs> you, you've done a lot with, you seem to like working with paper. I remember a book you did for Book Hug Press called uh, Refuse, which is uh, torn, pieces okay. of torn paper. And I'm sworn to secrecy over what book I actually uh, <laughs> I am. Jasmine, uh, what, what about when, when you're working with books that because Arsenal Pulp does, does some work um, 
uh, does some of the books in um, Arsenal Pulp produces do have an element of sexuality to them. Um, they, they do, Arsenal does a lot of LGBTQ stuff, uh, Amber Dawn stuff, um, the, the Siv e. Burnett book about um, um, her experience being a, a sex worker and so on. How do you negotiate the line between what will be acceptable to show on a cover and what will put off potential buyers who say walk into Indigo and see this on the new releases shelf? Yeah, that's a great question because I think as a small press, um, we do we, like, we can get away with a bit more than bigger publishers do, and and we can take um, you know a more uh, it may be slightly more unique approach to those uh, discussions. But it is of course a fine line because we want uh, in the end everybody to read these books. They're important books that need to be discussed, and we don't just want one community to be looking at them or another community to be totally turned off, but we also want to, of course, respect the original community that created the book. Um, so I think it's really in those cases, a leaning on the author quite a bit, who's from a particular community, understanding that I might ha not have the you know experiences that they do. So working with them about what, um, you know, what, what's coming up in terms of trends and the people surrounding them, uh, especially with that book um, about sex workers, you know, looking at artwork by sex workers was really important to kick off that conversation. Um, so we're starting from a place that's really grounded in the work itself. And then of course, you know, you, you can't show ex sexually, sexually explicit images. So we navigate around that, but um, I think having it being really grounded from the beginning and the author's experience really helps. And because we're a small press, we do involve the author um, from the beginning in those conversations. So right. um, that's the approach that I, I usually take. I, I do want to talk about um, author input because it's a it's a really important part of the process. Um, I should make uh, two housekeeping notes before we proceed. Um, if you look at the chat, there is a link to a Jamboard, uh, which uh, on which Lauren is. Uh, valiantly uploading um, the covers that we speak of specifically. So if you if you click on that link right now, for example, you can actually see the cover for Maidenhead that, uh, that Ingrid um, designed so brilliantly. Uh, the other thing I should note is that there will be, I hope, time for an audience Q&A at the end of this session. And if you type your questions into the uh, Q&A at the bottom of your screen, we'll get to as many of those as we can. Um, the idea of not, uh, you know, not showing sexually explicit stuff uh, on on a cover is, you know, and not showing graphic violence and that kind of thing is 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 kind of obvious. Um, but I wonder, I want to talk a little bit about some other sort of rules and and guidelines that you use um, in terms of creating covers. But Nathan, perhaps you can start with this because this this might be a good place to give the designers something to push back on. Um, what really frustrates you these days about cover design? What, what, what do you never want to see again on a book cover? Oh my God. Can we talk about British genre fiction for a moment? Um, <laughs> there's, there's this horrible thing that's happened uh, in the UK. And I, I would say it's the worst thing that ever happened. Uh, don't at me. I don't care about recent events. It's the worst thing that happened was they gave over every British uh, the cover of every novel um, in thriller, in crime fiction seems to need a tagline now. Um, like it's a movie, like just when you thought it was safe to go back to the <laughs> post office, you know, you know, stamped, uh, you know, uh, it, it, and it's just, and it's, it's, uh, uh, it's it's relentless and it's it seems to be unshakable and it's and it seems to have cemented itself as a rule for like you know this is how we must sell books so so i hate that that's terrible um also um i mean i not i don't don't not so much that i hate this but i think it's it's something always to bear in mind especially for you know as i am a a solely digital bookseller um for the past while um uh the the cover is often going to be seen it's going to be seen head on and it's going to be seen small um and all of the loving detail that's really that, that's that's wonderful to appreciate when you actually see it closer to to what we imagine to be full size like a hardcover you're only going to see that once once the that that's like the second or third click in the user's in the like customer's journey so so there's a lot to be said with about a lot to be said for contrast for 
you know, if the title is not going to be fully legible or something should be legible in that thumbnail view, it doesn't need to be the title. It could be the author. It could be some other aspect, but, but that vision of like, I know we have amazing, like designers have the best gear because they're, it's, it's, it's the, it, as, as one would expect from professionals, but there's something to be said for like, you know, the um, symphony conductor, making sure they, they have a listen to, to their, their masterpiece through like one half broken ear pod, just to make sure it's still, <laughs> it, still, it still gets across and that there's still something there that makes you want to get a better set of headphones and get the whole thing. Right. Right. Uh, the, um, the bit about the tagline is interesting. I have noticed this on some British thrillers, but I wonder, Gigi, uh, maybe you can speak to this having come from a place like Harlequin. Is that a designer's decision or is that something that's imposed from above by the publisher? It's usually from the the group itself, like the vision, right. um, the editor and the marketing team together um, feel that, you know, sometimes a tagline might help um, bring together uh, the cover. Sometimes it um, sometimes it's great to have the tagline with the image. It, it does work together and, and tell a little bit hint more to the story and pique your interest. Um, but it's interesting, yeah, if it's a dig small digital, you don't see the tagline. And, right. Yeah. Right. But we hear that a lot from, I think, from sales that, oh, maybe a tagline would be great here for this cover after, you know, we've done many comps and then you're like, oh, where am I going to fit this tagline now? <laughs> <laughs> Jasmine, how much attention do you pay to what the sales team and the marketing team tell you in terms of what, what can sell and what they can't sell? Yeah, um, I think, again, Arsenal has a bit of a different uh, approach to this, which is great, is that, you know, we do publish books that other publishers don't or avoid that are tricky subjects. So I think, um, or, you know, from marginalized communities as well. So we have had feedback that says, you know, this isn't going to sell this, you know, even that book that I was talking about that I think is in the jam board now, um, this is my real name. We had feedback from booksellers that said, this isn't going to work. It's, it's, you know, like the, I think they said something about the, the male gaze or something. And we were like, wow, this is just not at all what we were <laughs> going for. I think that's the wrong take. And we as a team collectively decided to ignore that because that particular buyer just wasn't getting the book anyway. So if we had, you know, changed things to work for them, then it would have been a, a disservice to the book and the, and the audience. So, um, you know, we definitely have made big changes to covers because of uh, sales and marketing feedback, because at the end of the day, we're creating commercial products that we want to sell well and uh, be picked up often. So we do take that into consideration, but um, sometimes we have a bit, try to have a bit of a wider conversation as a team as to whether or not it should actually be changed. Natalie, what about you? Have you received a pushback from your clients as to, to, you know, covers that they say will not sell for whatever reason they're too abstract or they're not, um, they're not appropriate for the title or, or what have you? Oh, definitely. I feel like that means I'm doing my job properly when that happens. <laughs> I give at least one or two of the mock-ups as taking it too far. Um, I think that's okay. Um, it's funny, as a freelancer, I'm not necessarily involved in the marketing meetings, so I don't necessarily get all of the direct feedback. I'll, I'll just get, you know, this one, you know, this one's killed or this one wasn't the right direction, we're going this way instead. Um, so I don't know the specifics of why something was deemed un unsellable or, or whatever. Um, I think that's one of the, I guess the pros and the cons of being a freelancer is you are sometimes in the dark there. Right. Um, again, that's why I think it's a good idea to have a, present a range of concepts from, from you know, more, more typical, more predictable to, more risky um, and then just see see what lands when everyone weighs in. I'd like to talk about the the process of going through comps and, and you know testing different things to see how they land. But Ingrid, you're you're a you're a big fan of breaking rules uh, on your covers. What what is what are the rules that you most like to break? I am <laughs> I think you are I <laughs> okay um well uh Goodness, what do I like to break? <laughs> um, I don't know. You'd have to 
give me a specific cover at that point. <laughs> it's like fair enough. Um, yeah. I, I'm thinking of you do a lot of work for Coach House. You you've been, yeah. you know we've already talked about Maidenhead. Um, the one that I uh, encountered just recently um, in prep for some panels that I did at Eden Mills is Robert McGill's latest book. Um, oh, that went through the ringer a bit. Um, yeah, it came um, out with a very satisfactory cover. It was the end. Um, did you, I'm sorry, you thought it was a very satisfactory cover? I, I thought it was. Um, it was a lot more wild beforehand. Right. Um, but uh, there was a lot of feedback coming in from sales mostly, and, and uh, we took it all into consideration. And uh, I think it ended up working out okay. But it was, it does play with things that usually don't see, you don't see on a cover, like green smoke. <laughs> so, <laughs> for for people who, for people who aren't familiar with the book, it's called A Suitable Companion for the End of Your Life. And it's a, a literary spec fic story about this uh, woman who lives in a society where you are able to take your own life by getting these people who have been what's called flat packed they've they've died from a or they, they, they've avoided de avoided death from a global plague by basically getting themselves freeze wrapped and then yeah. you're sent to somebody who wants to be in the company of somebody at the end of their life they're, they're planning to end their life and you basically reinflate them by blowing into a, a, a little nodule on their neck um, and the cover is basically an orange cover with just a box with smoke coming out of it, which I found very abstract. And it's, it goes back to what you were talking about earlier about giving an idea of what the book is about, yes. but not actually explaining anything. Well, with that cover, um, I, I think that Robert was looking at like Casper bed um, mattresses and how they get rolled <laughs> into boxes and sent to people. <laughs> and uh, he'd requested some sort of Ikea flat packing that we could put that on the cover, which is very esoteric. <laughs> it just probably wouldn't evoke much um, emotion from a reader except for irritation over Allen keys or something. So. <laughs> Reading the book, and, and the, there is a whole thing about the, the blowing up of the person um, and how it tastes and, and everything like that. There you go. And um, oh, looking into that, I ended up in blow doll ter or uh, blow up doll territory, which is not, it's not a sexual book. <laughs> so I just couldn't go there. Um, but the, the green cloud is, is something that people have a strong reaction to. So we had to play with depth on that one and trying to make sure that it wasn't too gross <laughs> too but also wasn't too like it, it um it made sure that it was also sort of showing something about what the the actual storyline was about in kind of a way As <laughs> mostly I say, it asks the question so you can pick up the book <laughs> it, so. it, it is very abstract um Gigi maybe I can ask you and then I hope this is not throwing you a curveball please please tell me if it is um a suitable companion for the end of your life one of the biggest problems I would think from a design perspective is getting a title that long onto a cover. What, what do you do when you're presented with a book like that um, to sort of mitigate the fact that either the title or the author's name or, or you know, anything else textual is going to take up a good chunk of the cover itself? Yeah, when it's such a long title, it is a it's like a like a type 101 uh, exercise like back in design school I think so <laughs> it's really uh, I think I think it's a great exercise for for you know figuring out your type hierarchy and making sure it's legible um, playing with size and contrast and placement um, yeah it's it's a great exercise definitely. <laughs> Natalie, you've done a lot of work with typography and you, you seem to be a fan of, of covers that privilege type over um, over illustration. I'm thinking specifically um, in the, the most recent um, covers of yours that I've seen of Sharon English's book, uh, Night in the World, um, which is basically there's 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 a type is the type is dominant, both the author's name and the title. Um, and then, you know, there's there's some some background image there, but the image certainly doesn't assert itself above the type. How do you work with imagery and typography? And when do you decide which should be foregrounded over the other? I mean, is it as simple as some titles are more compelling than others and sort of deserve the, the center stage? Uh, it might be. Um, I, I mean, 
some titles are working harder than others. To be honest, I, I think you have to let them do their job sometimes. And then other times the design is sort of doing the heavy lifting and filling in the blanks that the title uh, has left. <laughs> right, so, right. Yeah, I mean, I do think ideally there's a happy marriage between the type and the image. And I, and I think in the last 10 years, that's one of the, the coolest trends in, in book design is the integration of type and image. Because for a lot of years, it was, you know, slaps and type in a box on top of a painting or something. And, uh, and you know, very little, uh, very little, you know, marriage between the two, two elements. So I think it's really nice to have them working together. Uh, but yeah, some titles I think are just so fantastic. You have to just respect them and give them the, the center stage and do your best to, um, like Jasmine said, almost like a, a type exercise in school where it's like, how do I use these letter forms and how do I uh, just let the, the language itself be front and center instead of right. trying to cover it up with, with something or have it compete with photography or illustration. Nathan, we, we were talking earlier, you were talking earlier about um, the importance of having a, a cover that can jump out of a thumbnail. Um, yeah. Does that mean that that type heavy covers really make you react violently? It, it depends, right? If, it, if, if the type heaviness is to convey uh, a loquacity, uh, big ideas, uh, noisiness, right? If it, it's all, it's all of a piece to, to um, it's, it's telling a story by how it sits on the sits in the in the frame. And I was going to I I, I was just observing as as Lauren was dutifully arranging these covers, how <laughs> e each of these is also like it's turning the and, and it's it's to Natalie's point that if, if you've got a if you've got a great title to work with, then 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 you've got then some of that work is being done for you. And, e and in each of these cases, the cover has turned the title into into a very brief poem. Whether it's it's you know Ingrid slashing head from Maiden. Um, or dancing down to the monosyllabic end of life with the Robert McGill one, you know, this is my real name sitting parallel to the author's name. And then the way like night world sits there and then in the is drifting the other direction. Like they're all doing a thing right. that works when I bring them up close and, and works. And because, because we're dealing with so few words, it works instantly. It does, it does what good poetry does, which is it, is it makes sense before you understand it. But also each of these, each of each of these examples, if you you know put them at arm's arm's length, maybe you can make out a word or two, but there are there are elements that that, that draw you in and want and, and compel you to find out, you know, a suitable companion. What? You know, you want you're leaning in. And that leaning right. in, I think, is critical. I think I think one uh, cover that I've seen in the last few years that really works well in terms of melding a very interesting type topography or, or type design with uh, commissioned illustration is the cover for Casey Platt's short story collection, Dream of a Woman. Um, and, and I know that, that, that Jasmine, um, that, that was an illustration that, that you didn't do, but um, can you talk a little bit about that cover and, and, and you know, how the team at Arsenal Pulp settled on it? Because I, I really do think it's an interesting example of how to meld type and imagery in a very unconventional way. Yeah, for sure. That one, uh, that illustration, what came to us kind of as is, and we didn't, usually when we commission uh, artwork, we will kind of work on sketches first and then kind of build it towards the end idea. But that one kind of came from a vision between the author and the illustrator. And I believe it was two illustrators collaborating as well that kind of worked on it together. Um, so when it came, that was kind of the done deal. That was what we were working with and we were off. And I think it's such an, it, it's such an interesting, um, and unique drawing and the hands coming out. It's got this kind of like gooey, creepy feel to it, but there's also a bit of like sensuality between the hands. Um, so for me looking at that and the swirls, it just became evident that I kind of needed to do something that was more organic to, make the title even fit in a way that didn't kind of crowd out the art as well. And there was that nice open space on the side that had enough kind of open um, curving lines in the brush stroke in the background that I could draw the type on top of it. Um, I think it could have worked maybe with uh, like a, a, you know, a, a non-hand done font on it as well. But I think that allowed it to 
um, integrate, as Natalie was saying, with the artwork a little bit better um, right. rather than having slapped, you know, the title on top. And it is a very difficult thing to do, especially when you're working with uh, commissioned artwork and long titles and say the artwork had to be there and you've got to somehow figure out a way to make them work where they both stand out and, and don't fight. Um, so I think often kind of hand drawing the type in, in places that make sense can, can do the trick. That's a very unconventional cover. Um, and, and Ingrid, you've done a bunch of unconventional covers. We see a couple of them on the jam board. Um, you know, Natalie, um, same. I'm wondering about trends though, um, because, you know, there will always be trends that appear, whether it's the red cover or um, the, the art director at Quell Inquire and his design roundup for last year was talking about the blobs of color that appear on various book covers these days. It's it's often not something that that is planned. It just sort of happens. But I wonder if there are any recent design trends that you really appreciate or that you really dislike? And Gigi, maybe we can start with you. Um, I'm loving how we're seeing more representation on covers. Um, I think that's really important. I've been waiting a long time to see that, I think, in, in my career uh, uh, through publishing. So it's not nice to see, especially in YA, um, all the, the heroines and heroes being represented appropriately, I think. When I first started in YA, there was a lot of backs of people, or very small people in the distance, and it, and I think uh, sellers or, or sales force was really timid to show show the real um, look of people because they thought, you know, we want to um, sell to the general like most most population um, of of readership, but you know, it wasn't doing any service to the author or to, to the story. Um, so that's something I'm really happy to see. Um, also, I, I'm loving how how graphic novels are, are being a huge, huge um, thing now and, and seeing like even um, the Babysitter's Club, I, I grew up reading and seeing that now as a graphic novel <laughs> um, series. That's really fun to see. Um, yeah, I think those are some new ones. Ingrid, going, but going back to um, this panel back in the day, you, you, you've heard me um, complain about the woman walking away from the, the viewer, um, the back of the woman walking away from the viewer on covers, or um, Canadian novels that have bucolic trees on them and things like that, uh, usually in a sepia tone. Ha Fortunately, I haven't seen a lot, but you still see the woman with her back to the, to the reader, um, often walking to the end of a pier. Um, but, the, but the other, you don't see that much, but I'm wondering if there are any trends like that that you can think of that, that really bother you these days. Sorry, we, I, I think your mic's on mute. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I think the blob, um, that, that's fading away fast, thank heavens. Um, what I'm seeing is actually um, people trying to do a, a, the same kind of ride of color, but they're using pastels now. So they've changed the palette, but not the idea. Right. Um, and so I'm seeing that. Um, I'm not sure that it's like as effective because like one of my favorite covers, like you, has, you were asking about the favorite covers from the past year. And um, I had um, Clara and the Sun. And because that's the that's the opposite of all of the <laughs> of it's it's vibrant it's so vibrant but it is so specifically like restrained, um, and I prefer the cover. There's a cover that's just orange and it has like a little window with blue and a little hint of a circle that looks like the sun. Um, that sort of once you once you can interpret what that looks like, what that means that it's a window instead of just a rectangle, right. you start to see a scene and you start to see an interior, um, but it's not a whole bunch of things mixing around the cascading type on a cover, um, trying to hide and, and show itself at the same time. It's very direct. So, I don't know, I, I'm not sure whether you're talking about the paperback, the trade paperback version of, this is Kazuo Ishiguro. Yes. Novel Claire in the Sun. Um, but the, the original hardback, North American hardback, um, did that. And they, they actually literally created the window by doing a die cut on yep. the jacket. 
And as a former bookseller, I can tell you that booksellers hate die cuts. Yeah. Why? Because they tear. And that Almost means that before you... you get them out of the box, half of them are tearing, <laughs> right? And I see Nathan nodding his head. Why, do, do, you, do you share that concern? I don't share it anymore. That's why I went, I, die cuts <laughs> Die cuts chased me into digital book selling. I was happily working <laughs> physical retail, but I'd, I, I, one more die cut came out of the box and that was it for me. I needed a desk job where I'd work on the internet. <laughs> yeah, it's horrible. It's, it's terrible. And, and the problem is you can also just like, they're always great. Like I've, I'd never seen a die cut design that wasn't like, that didn't make me go, wow. Right. That wasn't like, this is so smart. Anywho, time to die onto the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> breaks my heart breaks my heart natalie where are you on die cuts or or maybe any other design trend that you might wish was over uh well for the die cuts just shrink wrap those things man just shrink wrap them <laughs> <laughs> that's so good for the environment <laughs> <It'll> add- <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the book itself is uh, arguably not my good for the environment, but um, yeah, I, uh, I mean, I agree with what everyone's been saying. I, for about 10 years or so, I avoided putting people on covers in any form because I couldn't figure out how to do it in a non-cliche way. And now it's so refreshing to see so many um, cool approaches to figurative work on covers, um, really neat portrait portraiture like combined with other images um again that's the kind of thing i i think of as taking a, a risk when you have a face and it's mangled with flowers or abstract patterns or texture or something like that i think it's uh i think it's really neat to see and it shows uh shows some steps forward in terms of um you know diversity and 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 everything like that so th- that's great in terms of putting people on covers um, forgive me if my 12 years at Quill has sort of fogged my brain. You were the designer, and I'm not going to be able to remember the, the title or the author of the cover with a woman's booted feet jumping off a box. Yes? Uh, yes. Um, yes. I do remember that and can you tell, because I love the story behind that cover. Could you tell the story of how you created that cover? Yeah, yeah. So that was, um, I wonder if I have it here. Uh, That was uh, back before I was even using stock photography. I had a strict no stock photography policy when I was 21. um, That no longer exists. Uh, But anyways, I took that photo of myself, I set up a camera on a tripod with a timer and then would jump up in the air to try and get myself jumping. Um, The book's called Roost. uh, And again, this was maybe 15 years ago, so it's hard to remember, but uh, it was sort of a domestic uh, novel written from the perspective of a mother with a crazy house life. And uh, it's actually, there's a sequel coming out. So I just found out the author, Ali Bryan, has written a follow-up that's going to be coming out with the same publisher, Freehand Books. So I might actually have an opportunity to revisit that cover <laughs> and then to create a different <laughs> companion, uh, which will be fun. Um, but yeah, that was um, back in the days of very analog work, uh, trying to stay off the internet. So uh, thanks for bringing that up. It's, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, 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 don't, yeah. I don't mean to bring up uh, uh, negative experiences. How many times did no. you jump off the box? It was, I mean, I wouldn't say it was negative. It was, but yeah, tiring. It was, I had to take a hundred photos to get one where the, it looked uh, like I was jumping and not hanging. It was very awkward. Yeah. <laughs> Um, going back to uh, Claire and the Sun, um, which I, I had to ask whether it was the, the trade paperback or the, the hardback that you were referring to, I, I'm fascinated by how and why designers and or publishers make a decision to change a cover design from one format to the other. Um, and, and I wanted to ask you, and, and Gigi, maybe we can start with you again. Um, what, if, if you're going to change the cover design from a, a one format to the other, from a trade paperback to a mass market, from a hardcover to a trade paperback, what informs the decision of whether or not you keep the same design or whether you change it, change it up entirely? I think um, from my experience, it's not our art decision usually, but um, from my, my experience, it's usually another chance to bring the book to a new audience of, of readers or, or 
get their attention in a different way. Um, so from hardcover to trade often, with the trade, you know, um, we'll often show a little bit more of the story. Not, I feel like with hardcovers, they, we do a little bit more more hinting of it. And then with trade, sometimes uh, we'll actually show a little bit more of the story, maybe show a person or a hint of somebody or as if someone was there. Um, that's often the case uh, of, of a slight change of direction, but still, you know, trying to capture the story. And then with mass market, it's a little bit more commercial um, with the, um, with more of a, even more storytelling on the cover. Um, but it, it is a challenge because sometimes when we get the brief, we're like, oh, this book again. <laughs> and at first I'm like, oh. But then after you get over that initial, like, we have to do this again, but we, I do enjoy the challenge of like, how do we, you know, how do we attack this in a different way? Right. Um, I think it's, it's a great, great, another great design challenge. And, um, and, and you'd be surprised. We actually, you know, come up with a lot of different ways of, of doing the same title. So it's kind of fun to see. Jasmine, does the format of a book um, influence the way you design it? Yeah, I mean, I at Arsenal in general, and I also work with self-published authors, primarily you're doing the paperback for cost reasons. Um, we don't do a lot of hardcovers unless they're for kids' books specifically. Um, but definitely there's different design considerations when you're doing a hardcover. You're dealing with, um, you know, making sure there's more of the artwork to wrap around. So just from a technical perspective, you're dealing with different things. But um, I do think that hardcovers tend to be you know, a, maybe a slightly more highly designed piece, if you can say that, like they're, it, they take a more subtle approach, I would say, generally to design, they, they seem to be more artistic in ways in general, especially when we're talking about like literary fiction, and then the paperback, I often see is more, um, as Gigi was saying, a little bit more descriptive to the book, potentially, not always. And, and of course, sometimes they're the same. Um, Ingrid and I were actually talking about this uh, on a different call about how it might actually make more sense to keep them the same. And I think that that makes a lot of sense because by the time the book is out there, you know, there's just hundreds of thousands of books getting published all the time. So if a reader was interested in the hardcover, but they were waiting for the paperback and, you know, it comes out in the paperback in a different form, will they immediately be like, oh, that's the book I had wanted to read, but didn't want to spend $40 on. Like they might pass it in the bookstore versus being like, oh yes, that book is finally, you know, in paperback. So I think that's an interesting consideration for publishers who are doing the, the hardcover paperback. I, I see Nathan, think... I see Nathan nodding. Sorry, Ingrid. Oh, I also think that, um, especially with the way that, uh, like, when we when we were talking about this in this other call, um, we're talking about like the idea that you have you have only a window, a certain window to get um, visuals in front of an audience, and I, I think the average is two books a year people buy. Like that's the Canadian average. So we're not we have a lot of books, and we're trying to get them in front of a few faces for people who are just going to buy a few of them. Right. And if you start changing the visual, the face of it, it can be a problem. What's compounding that is that we have a U.S. And, and U.K. market that spend a lot more money on marketing and publicity for their titles. And they use that social media to just blast that out there. And so you'll have, I had it where um, there was uh, the Copenhagen trilogy <laughs> and uh, I really wanted it. Um, and my partner, I was like, you have to get it for Christmas. And I looked it up because I'm so specific about my covers. And I realized, that the, <laughs> I wonder why. And I, was, I realized that the paperback had ch been changed in Canada right. from the original, which was a portrait of uh, Tove, Tove Davidson uh, with her eyes sort of going into three different areas. It had been changed. And I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> He hates me asking for books for Christmas, by the way. <laughs> so um, he has a he has an account in Waterstones in the UK, just in case <laughs> he needs to get me the UK edition of something. And I think that was the case. He actually gave me a photograph of the book and said it's on its way. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, is that's what I had seen. And when I actually went into one of my local indies here, which we're lucky enough to have in Toronto. It's like, it was a different book. It was right. a different cover. And I did not want that. Right. So. 
Nathan, I, I noticed you nodding vigorously yeah. uh, um, it, when when Jasmine was talking about the difference between when uh, hardbacks that have an interesting design and then the paperback comes out and it's a completely different design. Does that frustrate you as a as a bookseller? So frustrating, so frustrating. Um, it, and it and it's to 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 what's been said and what what Ingrid said about like the the we we do ourselves no 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 good service when we overestimate the amount that customers care about books, the amount of headspace, they're like the amount of cognitive space they're devoting to keeping track of what they might like to read. And to, to uh, did I lose everybody? My monitor just died. Um, I can still see you. To like, to just forfeit the equity that you've gotten First wave, especially that first wave of publicity where all the dollars get spent and people look at the thing and then to just kind of toss it away when you're literally taking market by going to a lower price point, uh, it's it's just, it's bananas and it and it does drive me up the wall to to feel like we're when in fact it's a book you already want at yeah. a new price point. One, one of the um, interesting um uh, changes from a uh, uh, hardback to a paperback that I remember and that really frustrated me was um, many years ago now, Terry Nemo at Random House did a design for Nino Ricci's novel, The Origin of Species, which featured um, a, uh, one of the Galapagos birds on the cover. But the thing that really sold it for me was there was a, an imprinted coffee cup stain. It, this was about a, an academic, somebody who was, who was um, you know, um, pursuing a, a degree at, I believe, McGill University, and there was a coffee cup stain. There's a stain of coffee at the bottom right of the design. When the paperback came out, it was exactly the same cover minus the coffee stain. And I asked Terry, I think it was at one of these back in the day, I asked Terry, you know, that, that, was, that was a great design and what really sold it for me was the coffee cup stain. Why did you remove it? And she said, because booksellers were complaining that people were coming up to them and asking, can they get a copy without the stain? That they didn't understand that that was part of the design, essential part of the design. Natalie, have you ever had any experience like that? Or have you ever had someone tell you you have to come and change a design because it, it maybe backfired in a way you weren't anticipating? I'm sure I have. I don't know that I could think of it off the top of my head, though. Um... I might have to. I might have to come back to you on that. Fair enough. Where, where are you on the idea of um, swapping out designs for books, be they from format to format, or if you're reissuing a book um, in a, a updated edition? Where are you about changing the the covers for those? Again, I haven't thought that much about it because I typically don't have a, an opportunity to do both a paperback and a hardcover. Um, right. But everything you guys are saying makes total sense. It, it seems sort of silly. Um, Although as a designer, I might like to get a second try at something. I kind of like that side of it. Um, uh, even now, going back into my portfolio from like Roost 15 years ago, um, the opportunity to redo that might be sort of fun. So I could see, I could see it being uh, a good challenge for a designer. But yeah, for the market, it seems like a completely crazy thing to do. Uh, <laughs> so, what about series? What about sorry, Gigi? I just want to, I did have experience with uh, design needing to be changed because um, buyers thought or co consumers thought it was like broken when they received it. So it was a, a cover called Ginny Moon and there was a little bit of distress on, on the cover. It's a red cover with some distress on the edges and apparently Amazon was saying a lot of people were returning it thinking it was roughed up and dirtied by the warehouse <laughs> so for our reprints we had to take it off so i was sad about that <laughs> and i i had one that was um it was uh, emily schultz and heaven is small right is, i love that cover and i worked on both the hardcover and paperback and the conceit is is that the uh person small is a copywriter or copy editor at harlequin even though it's not Harlequin. So <laughs> we went full blown bodice ripping romance on the back of the on, on the background of the cover. And then we put a big post-it note because he's actually working in the office and coffee is a big part of it as well. So there's a coffee stain on the post-it note. It's in yellow and says heaven is small and he Schultz. 
And people would come into the store and there's two reactions and both were rather interesting. They would try to peel off the, um, the, the post-it note first off. <laughs> <laughs> They were just they were just like picking away at it. <laughs> and, um, the second one is that even if they were being hand sold it, they were sort of hesitant because they thought it was a book that was a romance um, and not uh, this whole thing about um, a copy uh, editor who is actually dead in his office in this Harlequin-esque kind of um, publishing house. <laughs> and, um, so they really, so the, we thought we were, we thought we weren't being clever enough and it ended up being too clever. So what we did on the paperback was we pulled it back. I actually got an old, um, an old romance book and, um, superimposed the actual, still the cover with the romance on it and the post-it note. People were still picking it off, <laughs> but, <laughs> but at least that, that pullback on the cover where it suddenly had a blue background and, um, the, and then they could see like this really old, um, like red, uh, you know, when they usually spray the edges of the paper for these really old paperbacks. Yeah, like that. And then they'd see the rom uh, romance cover on top. Right. That that got more traction. <laughs> I can't, I was going to say, I can't believe that people tried to peel the post-it note off. But then I'm thinking to myself, um, there was a book by Craig Davidson a few years ago called uh, The Saturday Night Ghost Club. And it was, again, it's a distressed cover. So I think a lot of people were like, I, you know, I want one that's not all ripped and, and bunged up. Um, but it also had, it was a mock library book. So it had a mock library sticker on the book. And I do remember going to that and trying to peel that off at one point. And, uh, and that's, how, that's how effective the, the sticker was. Um, Jasmine, can you think of any situations? Like, I think the basic rule of thumb here is don't put coffee stains on book covers. <laughs> but uh, can you think of any situations that you've encountered like that? Honestly, not off the top of my head either. I can't, I can't think of any right now, but that is, that is so interesting. A, a point of going too clever. Um, Cause one part of book design is also making sure that you're not undermining the intelligence of the reader. Right. Um, and I guess you can't overestimate either with how clever you get, but also, I mean, that speaks to the great design that you did, Ingrid, and, and really fooling people. Same with you, Gigi, to fool people into really believing it. Um, so it worked on that. From that perspective for sure. <laughs> can, can we talk about what may be one of the most tenuous aspects of design and, and getting the design in front of readers and that's the author. Um, presumably in many cases the author has some input into a design but Natalie how, how much do you allow an author to dictate where the design of a book goes? I mean, it's that's typically up to the publisher, really. I try to respect whatever process is in place at, at whichever client I'm working with. Um, I think it's obviously very valuable to collaborate with the author whenever possible. They're, you know, if you're going to honor the content, um, you really have to try and figure out why they wrote the book they wrote, what they're really trying to accomplish you know, why it's that particular book and not another book. Um, I think sometimes having a conversation with the author is a really good way to get there in addition to reading. Um, but yeah, in terms of uh, in including their ideas and specifics, it can get a little bit tricky because sometimes they're attached to certain things and they're so close to the work if they've spent, in some cases, several years working on a novel, they're, they're sort of in tunnel vision mode and can't necessarily see other perspectives. Um, so, so yeah, it can be both, it can be both very valuable and very tricky. Uh, Gigi, what about you? Do, do you allow, or did you, when you were working at Harlequin, allow authors input into their covers? I think under contract, they all have consultation, um, but not <laughs> final approval. <laughs> so yeah, we always do definitely uh, listen and 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 appreciate their feedback since it is you know their baby that they've been working on for several years or more. Um, um, but the end, you know, we you know they came to us to uh, to publish and and we know what we're doing so. Um, we have to manage that relationship and, and understand that, you know, um, trust us and, and we'll create a great, beautiful package for you. Right. 
Jasmine, what about you as somebody who works for a publisher? Um, what What is the relationship that you as a designer have with the author of a given book? It's, I would say it's it's a pretty close collaboration, um, which I think is, you know, unique for trade publishers. But uh, again, under contract, of course, the publisher has the final say. So sometimes we have to, you know, really make that clear as we're moving through the design stages, if they're, you know, asking for things that aren't working. Um, but I think it's, as um, as Natalie said, it's it's a it's an important kind of conversation and and you know really knowing why they wrote the book, um, any dislikes and likes that they have in terms of design, and that's not to say that you're going to follow exactly what they say when you have that initial conversation. In fact, you probably won't because often the idea that that might be the initial thought of oh I want to see this person standing on a uh, you know on a cliff with the type over here. You're you're going to take that idea with a grain of salt, not necessarily show it and and show other things that you've um, thought of as you've been reading. But I think those initial conversations can really help um, at least avoid things that they're really going to dislike. Because um, at the end of the day, we obviously want authors to be happy with their books. Right. Um, we don't want to leave someone saying that they hated their cover and the publisher made me do this. And so um, we're still presenting ideas that we think are are working. And so internally, I'll present concepts to our publisher first, and then we'll pick a few to chat with the team about, and then only a few get, get shown to the author. Right. Um, and I do do a little bit of feedback back and forth with the author from there. But you know, if they're asking for things that really aren't working and some people depending on how close they feel to you as a collaborator or to the work they might get really nitpicky with you know move the type over here change it to green do this <laughs> you kind of have to pause those and and see where you can come up with a, a nice kind of consensus between everybody without letting the author run the show because again as Gigi said we are the professionals who know what we're doing so we do have to kind of walk that line and and tell people when things aren't aren't working and, right. and you know speak to our expertise for sure. Ingrid, I imagine if, if you heard from one of your clients that the author had come back and said change something to green, you would say no. But uh, are there are there any uh, are there any well, other situations where where you know you've had an author say, you know, I want you to do something that you're just unwilling to do? Um, I don't say no, I say why. Okay. So I have I have authors that come back and they want to see a few different iterations. Um, they want to see a few different colors and uh, they want to see a different typeface. <laughs> and um, I, I, I understand the impetus. They want to, they don't want to make the final decision based upon that, that one comp that is out of like three or five that they're, sometimes they're not even shown all of the uh, mock-ups. They're just shown sure. the one that the publisher wants. And uh, so that can be, that can feel like a little bit of a straight jacket, I think. But the thing is, is that um, when they're asking that, they're not asking, is, is the design effective? They're asking, um, is this actually the final? <laughs> right. And you have to sort of ask them, like, why do you want the type? To, why do you want the type to be green or for me to change the typeface? And I have to explain. It's like I've spent hours and hours and hours already on this one panel that you're looking at. Um, this isn't something I just sort of picked out of canva.com. It's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's something, and also it's like my, my years, if not decades of like experience, understanding how like everything fits together. So, but if you don't like it, that's okay. Just, you have to explain a little bit why you're coming at, at me at, like that. And then I'll go by and I'll change it. Right. Um, you know, I have a fear of green. Okay. Let's not do green then. Um, and there's a hole in the uh, talk about green covers and such from earlier on we can get back to, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but the typeface always bugs me actually because I'm known for type. Um, I've I know my type inside out, um, but at the same time they might also feel like uh, they saw that typeface on a rival's cover or right. you know you you just have to dig a little bit. Right. Anyway. Uh, Nathan, I, maybe I can come at this question um, as a bookseller this way. Are you able to tell when an author has basically designed a cover for, for like, I guess what I'm asking is, are you able to tell when they've hired a professional designer versus when they've oh, absolutely. done it themselves? Oh, well, there's, so there's levels of it. There's, there's, 
professional designer has had, you know, due, due course of control over this output. Professional designer uh, has been coerced. Uh, professional designer, and then like there's, you know, then coerced. Then there's like professional designer has probably been irreparably harmed, but definitely <laughs> was enlisted. <laughs> right? and, and then there's like uh, their nephew did it uh, last weekend. Um, and like, yeah, like, yeah, I mean, yes, I, I think, I think you can see because like, well, I, I would almost turn this around to a question I was dying to ask, which was where Ingrid said, you know, don't, I don't say no, I say why. And I feel like a part that, that's missing in this whole process is for the presentation of the cover to the author to include the designer explaining why that, that, you know, the author can explain why this character um, only appears in the ninth chapter, though they're pivotal to whatever. The, the author can explain word choices. The author can explain so much about the why of the book. Um, and and uh, I think, I, I feel like it would, I mean, it's a Pandora's box, right? So, so or it's not a, it's a can of worms. It's a different, different container with unpleasant things inside. But uh, it's, uh, I, I think it would be really interesting for authors to, to, to get to actually um, hear more from the designer about like, I am designing it in this way. I'm situating it here in this place. What spoke to me was this. I'm, um, there's a book I'm reading right now um, called The Late Comer by Jean Hanf uh, Corlitz. And the cover uh, features three flowers. And that was it. That's all the thought I gave to the cover as I'm reading, as I'm reading this book. It's, it's a perfectly, perfectly well-designed cover. Felt like, it feels like it speaks to the tone of the book. It's great. I'm enjoying it. And I'm like a hundred pages in and I just realized why there's actually a fourth flower, which I hadn't, which I wasn't noticing, uh, and why the book is called what it's called. So the thoughtfulness of that design that that made me, when paying it no mind, see only three flowers, made me not really know why it was called what it was called. Um, and then, and then to come back at it, when I got to that 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 point in the story where I was like, "There's four. Obviously, there's four. And latecomer means this. And aha." And, and depending on like, we, I don't, I can ask Jean Hanf Corlitz, I'm interviewing her next week. That's why I'm reading it. Um, she may have feelings about what the most important part of the book is and whatever, but the, but, and, 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 and that, that's her prerogative as the author. But as a reader, it feel, it, it just felt so good to me to be at that, that point of relatively shallow, like to have shallow engagement where it was okay wading in a little bit and then feeling it like it all just clicked of yeah. course i'll change it when the paperback comes out <laughs> <laughs> the the i but the idea that that a designer should engage in a conversation with the author to explain the design natalie shouldn't a design work on its own like without a, a designer necessarily explaining why it's the way it is honestly i think for me part of the design process is writing of that rationale is just part of the thought process. And so as I'm mocking things up, I'm also drafting the email that's going to go to the client talking about what I'm doing, what I'm doing, right. what line I pulled this from, uh, why, you know, why it should be green or not green. Um, because I do, it's just part of my process and I feel like sharing it is valuable. And that does open up more of a discussion. Um, like Ingrid said, then you can get into the why instead of right. having these very polarizing uh, personal preferences for colors and things that really shouldn't be factoring in. Gigi, I see you nodding. Do you do you have to, to when you're when you go to to the sales team at Harlequin, for example, um, how much do you have to work to justify a design or to explain why you've done it a certain way? Um, there was no no uh, direct, I think, um, line in that in that sense between the art team and the sales so there's right. no explanation it's uh, expected to just take a look and and next cover next cover <laughs> so, yeah i do agree with natalie i was nodding along with natalie like it's great to have that rationale and i know when i work with outside freelancers or with artists we have that back and forth and um and i'm looking forward with tundra having more of a relationship with the authors um that's such a nice creative uh, experience. So it'll be a change for sure. Right. Believe it or not, we are running out of time. Um, and there are some questions uh, in the Q&A from our audience members. And one of them actually speaks kind of to what we've been talking about. And the question is, in talking about how you don't want to tell the whole story on the cover, 
How do you articulate that with authors who think every part of the story needs to be on the cover and then convince them of that? Does anybody want to take a shot at that? Um, I can speak to that a little bit. I think um, I, I get a lot of this when I'm working with the, the self-publishing companies and, and authors because they do really tend to have a particular image that they want to see and they want to show everything because they're, um, you know, they're, they're hiring you to do the job and that that becomes a very interesting different dynamic than you working with a publisher and the author's not paying you directly. Um, so they know that they are a little bit more at arm's length, but I think, um, I think when you're presenting the initial concepts and I, I do the same as Natalie, I, I present a little bit of a rationale with each one. I do think that authors tend to really come around from that standpoint with that rationale because they see that you've kind of expanded the story by not telling it all. You've left things open. You've created the mood. Whereas I think people, when they're they're initially thinking about their cover, they're thinking about the narrative and what will be more literal, but it's often not the literal representation that will be the most um, compelling or the, the easiest to connect to a reader. So I, I tend to feel that that kind of fades away. Once you've had that initial conversation, you could say, yep, I get it. I'm, I'm going to show you some other options. Um, you know, as, as Ingrid said, you asked a lot of why questions. Why do you want to see that? What's the reasoning behind it? Uh, and then that tends to dissipate a little bit after the first comps are, are shown. How many comps do you usually go through? I am curious to hear what everyone else says about this <laughs> because I, I know personally, like I go way overboard. Like I'll be in my sketchbook doing like 80 little thumbnails. And then I go in and like star the ones that I want to try out digitally or in analog crafting. And then I probably try to do like 15 to 20 of those and then try to refine them so that the team can understand. And I think that's why the rationale becomes so important because recently I was working on this really complicated cover and in presenting, you know, five kind of polished comps to the publisher, it's really hard to get five that are, especially when you're, you know, painting or collaging that look like finished pieces, um, because you don't want to spend 20 hours on something that's like not going to be chosen. Um, so I think that rationale goes a long way in explaining what you're going for and maybe what the like the polish would be at the end too. Right. Um, so yeah, I try to, you know, my relationship with Brian, the publisher is, is a great one. So I can send him probably more than the average person does. And I'll go to him first, say here are, you know, the up to 10, sometimes more that I'm thinking of. And I'll say, I don't like this one for this reason, but maybe that's something the author wanted to explore. And then we'll have a conversation, narrow it down to, you know, maybe three to six to show the whole team, have a live uh, call about all of those ones and then hopefully show you know max of three to the author when we were uh, when I was doing excuse me Quill and Choir one of my one of the reader favorite um, sections was cover to cover where we traced a, the development of a cover design I remember a number of yours um, when you sent five or more comps and they were all totally different from one another is that, is that a normal practice for you? Do you usually do a bunch of comps that are completely different or do you often do one or two comps with minor tweaks to them? I do present things uh, very, that are very uh, unique uh, and usually on sort of a spectrum, like I was talking before, where one of them is sort of out in left field and is a bit of a long shot, but I feel like if they want to take a risk, then th this is the way to go. And then sort of heading toward more uh, traditional um, because I think it's nice to have those options. I think if you're just going to take the one concept and do it in three different shades of blue, it's not necessarily helpful. Um, that being said, I, I typically won't do four or five unique concepts these days. I think back when I was starting out, that was part of my process. It's, uh, it's definitely fewer now, I would say more like two to three, um, it's, you know, two to three very unique concepts that are completely different directions. Right, right. What about you, Ingrid? How, what's your process in terms of creating um, alternatives? Well, I, uh, I do some sketches and, and half the time it's uh, just writing down notes and Honestly, it's like there's a rectangle with a circle and it says void or something like that in it. Um, 
And then I start putting together researching images, um, put them into folders. Sometimes there's like 100 images in there. It's kind of weird. Well, different folders depending upon the different uh, sources. Um, and sometimes knowing I'm going to maybe be doing my own image. I put together, I try to just throw all those images onto um, a document and slap the type on top and then walk away for the day. And then the next day I'll go back and I'll just get rid of covers. <laughs> before I've even styled the type, but there's sometimes I'll just be like, oh, that really is the image. And I'll start styling the type. I can do that over and over for a few weeks where it's like, I don't know how many I've gone through at that point, but there's usually a seven that end the day <laughs> and it's a different seven the next day. <laughs> <laughs> um, I try to show three different ideas. It's not always easy, um, especially if I'm very, I can be very stubborn. And uh, if I if I know that it's just the one, and if I know it's just the one, and I trust, I have a good rapport with the publisher, I'll probably send that one. But I'll say, but if that doesn't work, I can continue, and I'll try right. to send as early as possible, so that they're like, no, that's not really where we're going. Um, and I have about a sixty percent rate of success with that. <laughs> So which is pretty good because then I don't have to show them two other things that I were really not interested in doing. So. Have, have, when that's happened, have they gone back to the first one afterwards? Uh, uh, that has happened sometimes, but that's very rare. It's just, <laughs> yeah, that, that is, they, they're second guessing because, I mean, you know this, there's, there's, it's not just us with the publisher or us with the edit, editor or, or publishing firm behind them. There's a whole bunch of other people. So we have the buyers at Indigo. If they run, if they go into the States, we have the buyers at Barnes and Noble. Uh, Amazon doesn't talk to us um, about covers or anything really. Um, we have that, we have the agent. So um, if the author has seen it and doesn't like it, they're gonna sometimes go to their agent. We're gonna have the agent weigh in because also, and if the author likes it, but the agent doesn't, they may weigh in anyway, because some agents are like that. Um, they're, looking, they're, they're looking out for their client. That's what they're doing. So we have the publisher, but then we, oh, um, if it's, uh, it's a co-pub, so a co-publication with the US or UK, we have that publisher. When I'm working on translations, I'll sometimes have the originating, uh, originating language publisher actually has a say in what the cover looks like, even though it's English Canada. So we know that we're like I can get away with the one <laughs> and then there might be some pushback because the person I'm talking to has all these voices coming at them. So. And, and I imagine one of those voices is, is uh, Nathan Maharaj from Kobo. Have you ever, have you ever pushed back on a cover? Not, not at Kobo. I, I, in my early naive um, days as one of those Indigo buyers uh, many years ago, uh, I, I, I don't remember what cover it was, but I do remember, I, I remember learning uh, as, as slow people like myself have to learn uh, that there's human beings all through the, this, this business. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> you, you can't just say stuff. Um, and that was how I learned that designers exist. Uh, that I, I should and that they have feelings. And they have feelings. And 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 I should not run my full mouth. Honestly, I don't remember what the cover was. I don't. But but there was there was that that moment where I realized um, I, I I hadn't adequately weighed the the heft of my responsibility. And as I was saying, ah, I'm not sure about that cover. Uh, and then it turned into a whole thing. And I was like, holy crap, really? Just because I said a thing. So yeah, that's a that's a thing. So yeah, I've, I've pushed back. I don't think it got changed. I don't think it got changed. I think I was able to, <laughs> they said they don't want to change it. And I was like, oh, thank God. Let this not, not, let this not be recorded in history. Because one of the first things that I learned, and I think this was also from my mentor at Stoddard Publishing back in the day, the designer is always right. And, and I have that bit of advice has stood me in good stead for almost, for more than two decades in the industry. Uh, and unfortunately, we have completely run out of time here, but I do want to extend my deepest thanks to Jasmine Welsh, Ingrid Paulson, Natalie Olson, Gigi Lau, 
and Nathan Maharaj for a wonderful discussion. Um, and thanks as well to Lauren Stewart and uh, the folks at Tech Forum, both for inviting me to be a part of this and for um, the terrific work in getting all those covers up on the Jamboard so quickly. Um, I hope that this has been a beneficial session for all of you who have tuned in. And uh, um, as I say, I, I really enjoyed, thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. So thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Bye. <laughs> Next time in a bar. This was <laughs> <laughs> this was